Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Texas Response to Commercial and Sexual Exploitation of Children web webinar. This is brought to you by the Judicial Work Group on the Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children. This was really recently renamed from the formerly known Judicial Work Group on Human Trafficking. January is Human Trafficking Prevention and Awareness Month, and we are so excited that you have joined us today. You will receive an hour and a half of MCLE credit. It, the information will be provided at the end of a session. Not only have we secured MCLE credit, we also have TBLS for uh, certified attorneys and family violence credit for judges. A copy of this PowerPoint will be sent to all presenters along with the reference material it additionally will be posted on the Children's Commission website in about a week or so with the material so that you can rewatch or forward to any professional or person that you think needs to know this vital information. It is now my extreme pleasure to introduce the chair of our work group, Judge Morellis. Judge? Good afternoon to everyone. I would like to thank everyone for being here. I am Judge Selena Mireles. I, I am a child protection court judge in Laredo, Texas. I preside over four counties that include Laredo and surrounding counties. I, along with Judge Amy Larson, serve as co-chairs on the Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children work group. We're very happy to have all of you here. The CSEC work group develops strategies to improve judicial handling of child welfare cases where children or youth are at high risk of becoming trafficking victims. We also focus on primarily on providing information to judges and attorneys responsible for child welfare cases to raise awareness about human trafficking as it impacts children involved in the child welfare and juvenile systems. We wanna go ahead and at this time, we wanna provide you the purpose of today's webinar. Today, you will hear from Alan Schoenborn from the Office of Texas Governor, Ada McLeod from the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, Sarah Hall from the Texas Alliance of Child and Family Services, Candace Dosman and Rhonda Kirkendall from Texas CASA, and Ryan Bristow from the Texas Juvenile Justice Department, who will provide insight into their agency's efforts to prevent, identify, and support children at risk and survivors of commercial sexual exploitation. The webinar will also include a moderated discussion led by the Judicial Work Group co-chair Judge Amy Larson from Travis County Ju Juvenile Court on how the respective agencies' actions combine to form a comprehensive response to the commercial sexual exploitation of children in Texas. I will remind you at this time that during the webinar, please use only the Q&A feature to ask any questions for our panelists. We will only be monitoring the Q&A feature and if you have any questions for a direct panelist, please make sure that to direct your question to that person individually. So go ahead and at this time, I will pass it over to Alan Schoenborn. Alan, you okay. Judge Morales, appreciate the opportunity to be here and to speak with folks across the state of Texas. Next slide. What we're gonna to cover today is going to be a quick overview. I'm going to highlight a few things that I think are of most importance to you and our work. Next slide. The first is to recognize that we began in 2016 following legislative mandate, which established our team as the very first team uh, in the state to uh, do this work. We respond, we are, we're in the public safety office and we respond uh, directly to uh, identified needs throughout the state of Texas. There are, uh, because it's Texas, we had to have a Texas star. So what you'll see here are the five points. There's a sixth regarding research uh, that I'll note later, but there are five points to our star in our effort to work on this with you and other stakeholders throughout the state. The first is to protect children and youth, to make sure that we are building awareness and resilience to child exploitation by curbing demand, by supporting targeted interventions, that reduce vulnerability of high-risk youth that have not previously been exploited by uh, making sure that we are doing prevention education for youth, for caregivers alike. 
The next is to recognize this because historically across the country, this is a victimization that is not readily recognized. So raising public awareness, making sure that we are uh, providing targeted training and outreach to recognize the survivors, to make sure that we identify and select and then distribute uh, a tool, including the training in that tool to identify uh, and then to support data collection to better understand who the survivors are uh, since we know they are living in our midst. The next is to recover. And that's a very, very important part of our work to make sure that we are uh, working with our law enforcement partners and our DFPS investigators when they recover a child to ensure that they have a place to take that child, to make sure that those earliest hours have a trauma-informed approach to make sure that we are building capacity for what to do in those earliest hours and days following a recovery or an identification of a child who may be safe and stable. That means uh, developing residential as well as community-based services so that youth can stay in their home if that happens to be where they are when the identification is made. We also, during this process, are building uh, regional continuums of care, care coordination teams and the like. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then uh, the last is, uh, the, the next are to support healing. We are not dealing with crisis scenarios only, but rather making sure that we are building a continuum for the long term. So that means making sure that we provide services to young adults and adults as well as youth uh, for a wide array of needs. Lastly is to bring justice and that's really to make sure that we're operating as a team so that we are building uh, capacity within our courts, making sure that everyone who uh, might be able to help with curbing demand is doing so, and that we are bringing skills and resources both to our investigators, our judiciary, our prosecutors, our defense attorneys, and the like. Next slide. To do this, Texas is large. We know we have to work with our state agencies, a number of whom are on the call with us today, as well as regionally. Uh, to make sure that we are getting closer to communities and locally with a county by county approach to do this. Next slide. That means that we have five regional administrators. You can identify the counties where you might be working in order to uh, identify who that person is. There's contact information that will be provided to you in the event that you need assistance to find out what resources might be available for a child with whom you're working. Next slide. The, uh, as I noted earlier, we are doing our best to recognize youth. And so the screening tool and supporting data collection are probably the two biggest pieces of that. Next slide. What the research has shown from West Coast Children's Clinic, the developers of that tool is that by the time they're identified, approximately three quarters of the kids had been exploited for two, for two years or longer by the point they were identified. Three quarters of them don't see themselves as being exploited either at the time or far beyond that recovery. And then uh, importantly, the, about half of them were 14 or younger at the time that exploitation occurred. Next slide. So we won't spend a lot of time on the particulars of the tool, except you should begin to encounter the see it or commercial sex exploitation identification tool in your work with these youth. Uh, and uh, the important thing here to notice is that there's three ranges for scores. Clear concern means that there's probable victimization that has occurred. Doesn't mean it's a known, doesn't mean it's confirmed, but it means that based on collecting information about what is known about that child, the likelihood of victimization is uh, present. Next slide. So what you see as in the data to date is that we have had about 55,000 screenings of youth in that age range. And uh, most of those, uh, this is already screening, not universal. So of youth who are in systems of care or otherwise already uh, likely to have higher risk, uh, we have about 72% that, excuse me, 71% with no concern or not information, but we have 13% that are clear concern. So the, the probable victimization has occurred for about 12% of that 55,000. This actually tracks uh, the uh, national data, which we'll take a glance at in a moment, 
Uh, DFPS data is not included in here. They're just beginning to do screenings in five of our largest urban communities. Uh, otherwise, they're using other screening approaches for their youth, so that data would not be included here. And again, I know Ada can talk about that uh, or respond to questions that might be needed. Uh, the, the top sites for this of over a thousand screenings each would be um, the CAC in Hidalgo County, a BCFS, and the CAC in North Texas. That's actually Denton with a name change recently. Next slide. So this is a national, just to give you some perspective. Again, 72%, no concern, not an inf information, 11.5 versus the 12.9 we saw earlier for us out of 121,000 screenings. Next slide. So we talked about recovering. Uh, there are very, very important elements. And again, these are here. You have in your handout locations and agency names for some of these folks but the advocates are the first, uh, and uh, that's a, a new profession we've created that bridges the gap uh, uh, between other uh, supports for youth once they're identified or recovered, and they then stayed involved for a long time. Whoops, there we go, thank you. Uh, next slide. So uh, what you see here is that we, we are recognizing the location for some of these services, drop-in centers and emergency shelters, it's really valuable if you are operating, again, in one of these communities that you help your youth to know that these services exist in the event that they are seeking to step out of the life to get away from a trafficker or uh, avoid uh, the, the unfortunate use of uh, survival sex in order to survive on the street. Next slide. So here's where advocates are. We cover at this point um, about 106 counties uh, with advocacy services. And uh, that means that they arrive immediately upon the scene when there's a law enforcement recovery and stay connected in a, in a trauma-informed relationship for uh, as long as they're there and the child's needs might dictate uh, to provide those services and supports. Again, it's case management as well as uh, um, a connection to all of the uh, systems of care. Next slide. This gives you a sense of, again, how the advocate doesn't replace, it simply supplements or fills in the gap with other uh, providers of similar services. Again, these are employees, not volunteers, which means they are responsible for being available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's a team, it's an agency that has multiple advocates, it's never an individual. And so what you see here is that it's not conditional. If they leave the hospital, then the sexual assault advocate no longer stays connected to them providing services. If they leave, DFPS, then CASA is no longer providing case management services in their life, uh, but the CSA advocate stays with them for the long term. Next slide. So the other thing I mentioned that's very important is care coordination, and you see some of the agencies that are involved in that. That's really about pulling together in a collaborative fashion folks to work uh, using the MDT approach, uh, and that means making sure that folks are talking about what they know and sharing uh, their efforts to uh, get everybody's objectives met, regardless of what agency might be represented. So next slide. What you, oops, what you see here is just a, a, a thumbnail version of what happens following a recovery. There's a whole host of things, a decision tree that shows who is doing what. There's a central uh, point of contact. That's the care coordinator, usually at the CAC, that's been trained for the role, and they uh, keep everybody's information up to speed as well as the moving parts, and then ongoing staffings occur. Next slide. This is where our care coordination teams are so far. Uh, at this point, we have about 15 of them, and uh, there are more coming in 22. So again, if you're operating in one of these counties, you should definitely be aware that care coordination is likely to be working with your, the child in CPS custody. Uh, next slide. So last few things to, to mention is just that we have uh, uh, strategies for long-term efforts, as I noted earlier, making sure that we are not doing just crisis stabilization. Next slide. This includes TBRI. If you're not familiar with TBRI, both uh, Judge Morales and, and Judge Larson have uh, deep end experience in TBRI work and uh, can certainly provide some uh, insight, but this is available uh, to folks. You can go to their website at TCU. Next slide. So this just gives you a sense of where some of those other uh, services might be available for adults as well as for youth. Next slide. 
Again, bringing justice, as we talked about earlier, is about bringing resources, training, uh, forensic experiential trauma uh, interviews as an example to make sure that we're working uh, as effectively with youth as possible in the system and clearly shifting uh, our norms to start seeing them as uh, victims rather than offenders or perpetrators. Uh, next slide. This just gives a sense of some of who we worked with. And the thing to point out here is uh, Baylor University is, has, is developing a customized uh, motivational interviewing training, which a number of our courtrooms are using. Uh, it is specific to this population. Next slide. We do have webinars available to anybody who's interested every month where we roll out uh, both best practices and research activity and the like. We, yeah, there are also a lot of resources on our website. That link is available on the handout that will be provided to you. Last slide, please. Contact information, you are welcome to reach out to any member of our team, uh, including me as might be helpful. And this once again is provided as a handout. Judge Marillis. Or Ada. Hi, thanks, Alan. My name is Ada McLeod, and I'm with the Department of Family Protective Services. Can you go on, go on to the next slide, please? We are. I'm on the human trafficking team, and I want to give you this um, high-level overview of DFPS and how we're involved with not only the governor's office, but um, how our team in particular is working around the issues of uh, anti-trafficking issues. Next slide. So Commissioner Masters really has made fighting human trafficking one of her priorities. She feels very strongly about this. And she's very concerned about our foster youth who age out of care uh, because they still face many challenges and that make them high, have a higher risk for them being vulnerable to the manipulation of traffickers and exploiters. And so she, she has given um, some very high expectations for our team and, and the agency as we all work together to, to look at how we are working with children and families um, that have experienced trafficking. Next slide. So our team in, um, individually, our Human Trafficking and Child Exploitation Division is really focused on making sure that we are meeting all the mandates, both state and federal mandates around trafficking. We um, are really looking at making sure that our field staff and everyone involved at DFPS is looking at best practices um, and where best practice doesn't exist, being able to really look at um, what, what is emerging in the field of trafficking to make sure that we're preventing and identifying and recovering victims the right, the best way that we know how as a field at the time. And really trying, working to improve our staff's capacity to, um, as uh, Alan has talked about, to identify victims of trafficking and recover those victims um, and really support those victims and their restoration. Next slide. So these are the definitions that are outlined in the Texas Family Code that DFPS um, uses when somebody calls the statewide intake to see um, and call and report. This is where um, everything is measured against. One of the things I really wanna point out is that um, the the key pieces of this is it's got to be a traditional caregiver, which we're going to talk more about that and what that means in just a minute. But these individuals that are um, the the people being accused of of committing the crime and the the offenses and the of being the abuser in our cases can be a couple of different ways. It could be that they they are truly the exploiter. They truly are that trafficker. They are knowingly causing it, permitting it to happen, encouraging kids to engage in this um, activity, right? Um, or they could be failing to make a reasonable effort to prevent it. So if, they, if a parent knows or a traditional caregiver knows that a youth is being trafficked and they are doing absolutely nothing to stop it from happening, then they could be um, found reason to believe in the DFPS um, under these DFPS definitions. You'll see all the links to the Texas uh, Penal Code. So um, our workers are really trained to be able to look not only just at this definition itself, but really dig into those penal code offenses um, to make sure that we are capturing everything that we should be in um, investigations. Next slide. So, 
what does it mean when we talk about um, these human trafficking cases in particular? Okay, so we investigate, as I said a minute ago, when a person is traditionally responsible for the child's care, custody, or welfare, that individual knowingly causes it to happen or fails to prevent it from happening. Bottom line, that's how we get involved. Next slide. So who, how do we define a personal responsible for some, someone's care, right? So it's gonna be your parents, it's gonna be the guardians, um, the managing conservator, right? Could be any member of the child's family or household. Um, if a parent is living with someone at the time, who uh, the adults in that home um, would be a, a personal responsible. And then we often forget, and people forget that we do those school investigations as well. So school personnel or volunteers for a school district. What we don't get involved with and we don't investigate, it's gonna be a law enforcement issue, is that um, a neighbor or um, an adult uh, boyfriend or girlfriend of the victim, um, or even uh, what we, the traditional pimp, that independent trafficker, we don't investigate those. That's gonna be completely law enforcement related. Next slide. So um, there's also varying ways we have to define everything and y'all know this in the law about what is a household. So, Here's the definitions, and you can dig into that administrative code to understand more about what the child's household definition really is. But basically, it's where the kids live in. All right. Uh, next slide. So, um, oftentimes we get asked, if, "Can't we just help? Can't we just help these kids? Can't we just be involved?" Um, and we don't have any right to be involved when there are protective parents. Right. If there are protective parents involved with this youth and child and or child, then it's inappropriate for us to be intervening in um, that child's life. Next slide. So this is not all of the FPS flowchart, but it is a large portion of us. So um, we work across several different divisions. You can see by this uh, graph, this uh, flow chart, that we are actually um, a division of child protective investigations. But these are the four, um, or the, I shouldn't say four, these are all the different departments, divisions, programs that we work with pretty closely. We work closely with statewide intake, um, helping to make sure that when people are calling the hotline that they have um, the information that they need to be able to dissect what the individual reporter is telling them. Um, we do lots of, they've done, done a lot of training around trafficking and making sure that their um, people that are actually taking the calls are understanding and being able to gather um, the appropriate information. We work closely with our prevention and community well-being division, and they are really looking at um, our prevention and early intervention, our faith-based services. So we do lots of work with them and helping do some community education. And then of course, most people are common when they think of us, the FPS, they think of child protective um, investigations and or services. So the child protective investigations really examines those reports of child abuse and neglect to determine if any, if a child in the family has been abused or neglected, okay? Um, and then our um, Child Protective Services really then does those ongoing services. They are the ones that are responsible for children and that conservatorship, right? They are working with those kids that have been uh, brought into foster care. And they really look for every reasonable alternative to keep kids safe before they end up coming into care. But when that doesn't happen, they do, as y'all know, come into that foster care situation. Um, and we really look for and work with not only the courts at that time, but also the family to hopefully reunite those kids as quickly as possible back with their family. That step in between investigations and conservatorship is that family-based safety services. And they really help provide services to families to help stabilize them and reduce the risk of future abuse and neglect. Um, sometimes, they um, can't, and those kids end up in conservatorship, um, or they are successful, and they are able to continue to work, um, to work with those families 
um, and, and help to resolve and mitigate those risks. So in, as a part of child protective investigations, besides our team as the human trafficking team, which we've already talked about, we also have um, special investigations and all of our special investigators are former law enforcement at some point in shape in their career. They've worked in law enforcement and they really serve as the liaison between our staff and law enforcement in lots of our cases. With these human trafficking cases, they're integral in helping our staff, um, our investigators, to be able to uncover and, and identify these victims. And they also work with our conservatorship caseworkers when youth go missing from foster care. So we are involved with all of these different programs and helping them um, further their work and education around um, trafficking. Next slide. So again, here's our contact information. Blanca Denise Lance is uh, our director. Unfortunately, she was not uh, able to be here with you today. And so you got stuck with me. And again, my name is Ada McLeod. Feel free to reach out if there's something that we can do for you. If you have a general question um, that we can help you with, you can always send it to our human trafficking at dfps.texas.gov mailbox. So I think now um, I'm going to pass th this off to Sarah Hall um, to help us know what all she's doing and what the Alliance is doing. Thank you so much, Ada. And uh, first off, I do want to say to everyone, thank you for your time and coming here today and being willing to, to listen and learn a little bit more about how human trafficking is being handled in the state of Texas. Um, in my role at the Texas Alliance of Child and Family Services, I am the CSA project coordinator. So I'm kind of uh, the one who's sort of overseeing all of, all of our activities in regards to this population. Um, I'm a licensed professional counselor associate, and I'm also a survivor leader in this area. Uh, next slide, please. This slide, yes. Um, so about the Texas Alliance of Child and Family Services, you may sometimes also hear us referred to as the Texas Center for Child and Family Studies. Knowing that this is a group of lawyers, I thought you might appreciate the distinction that the Alliance is a 501c6 membership organization comprised of about 150 to 200 child and family serving organizations across Texas. Uh, whereas the center is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that supports the efforts and initiatives of the Texas Alliance of Child and Family Services. And really what the Alliance is, is we uh, listen to organizations that are, that are serving um, so many of the children in the state of Texas uh, in one way or another. We sort of aggregate their voices. We uh, advocate for them at, uh, at the legislative level with, with the Texas state legislature. We work with state, local, and sometimes even federal programs to, to try and provide um, services and initiatives in order to support the needs of youth. Um, and we uh, also work to help sometimes with down granting federal funding in order to support these efforts. Um, yeah, uh, we, uh, a big part of what the center does is supporting child welfare professionals uh, through education, training, research, and technical assistance to really promote and develop best practices. Next slide, please. So what is our structure, right? I've said that I'm the CSA project coordinator, but what does that really mean kind of in, in the scope of the Alliance itself? So our team is composed of approximately 20 child welfare professionals on five teams, and we each support uh, and provide cross support for all of the different initiatives that we're engaging in across the state. We have five teams, uh, one that focuses on systems advancement, one that focuses on public and legislative affairs, one that uh, focuses on legal and regulatory issues. Uh, we have a finance and administration team and we have the learning team. Now, uh, this, um, sure, yeah, we can continue with that. Um, but as part of the learning team, uh, our CSA services for child serving professionals include uh, consultation, right? We consult with uh, organizations that are serving children. Um, and we provide a lot of different types of consultation uh, insofar as like clinical consultations in order to help support clinicians, regulatory consultations in order to help um, individuals and organizations determine, uh, you know, maybe if there's a change that they need to, to have to their policies and procedures, 
Uh, we do consult about how to communicate around different topics in the child welfare space, but especially around um, how to how to talk about commercial sexual exploitation of youth. Uh, we have uh, stakeholder engagement consultations, uh, trying to help organizations and agencies bring together different stakeholders who um, who are necessary for helping youth to get their needs met. We also do help um, both uh, both in the child welfare world, but really for any child serving professionals to help them uh, develop survivor informed policies and procedures. Uh, we also offer things like growth and sustainability planning. And so far as CSA goes, you know, we have definitely facilitated a wide variety of free to participant trainings on commercial sexual exploitation of youth topics from both state and national partners. And we have also been over the last year and a half uh, developing in house um, and then providing for, uh, for organizations and agencies uh, different advanced survivor informed CSA topic trainings and uh, customized trainings based off of the needs of whatever organization or agency has approached us. We provide technical assistance around, uh, around developing programming, around developing policies and procedures. Uh, we do provide a lot of technical assistance around figuring out how to connect resources to each other, right? So if we have an organization that is getting a lot of referrals coming in, we help them to form relationships with others in their community um, or even much further away from their local community if that's what's needed in order to support these youth. Uh, we do uh, engage in a lot of advocacy with the legislature around the services and needs for commercially sexually exploited youth. We engage in learning collaboratives, both for clinicians, um, but also for uh, other individuals who are in a child serving profession. And we engage in research. Back in 2020, we, um, we did a statewide assessment of, uh, of essentially, we polled 525 organizations to see uh, who had what types of services available for, uh, for youth. Um, did they have specialized CSA services? Uh, if not, what were the barriers? And out of the 125 responses that we got back, we were able to see that for most people, the barriers uh, to providing uh, services for these youth really are around needing that training and technical assistance, needing to understand what they're looking for when it comes to seeing, like when it comes to interacting with the youth and being able to see if it's possible that they've been uh, that they've been exploited, and then training on okay, well now that we've realized that this is an issue, where do we go from here? And so based on that research, we have really devised and built out, um, out these aspects of training and technical assistance that are available. Uh, next slide. So what are some of the tools that we support? So first off, you know, I, um, I feel like in some ways this mirrors Alan's uh, lovely chart just a little bit in the way that we first talk about prevention, right? Um, so for prevention, we really like Love 146's Not a Number Prevention Program. And we think that this works really well with community youth or youth with few risk factors. And then for, you know, sort of more mixed risk uh, groups or youth who may have a trafficking history already, we really prefer My Life, My Choices Exploitation Prevention Program because that, uh, that prevention program is uh, both evidence-based and has been um, researched in the context of, of uh, helping youth who don't have risk factors, helping youth who have some risk factors, helping youth with high risk factors, and helping youth who have already had a confirmed trafficking history. So, once we have prevention in place, you know, we kind of move on to screening and what we really support for screening is that commercial sexual exploitation identification tool, which is the see it. Um, we do have three trainers on staff who can help uh, train users in how to use the see it in order to determine if a youth has been exploited or not. Uh, moving from that, you know, trauma informed care is incredibly important. Once individuals have been identified as either high risk, clear concern, or have a confirmed trafficking history. And so we really, really uh, 
wholeheartedly believe in trust-based relational intervention, which is, you know, once again, uh, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm parroting Alan here, but uh, uh, as he did point out, that that is one of the pieces that the Office of the Governor uh, also really advocates for. But really what trust-based relational intervention is, is an attachment-based model of care for youth who have trauma. And currently we have six practitioners on staff who can uh, provide TBRI training and support. For program development, we uh, wholeheartedly advocate for the Texas framework for residential CSA services. That's probably going to be a little bit less used to y'all here, given that I know we are speaking to a team of judges and lawyers at the moment, um, but just knowing that, that there are specific programs out there um, who are utilizing this, who are uh, developing their programming based off of the categories that have been identified as needed areas uh, for long-term healing and recovery for these youth. And then for evaluation, both individual and aggregate program evaluation, we, uh, we are advocating for the Outcomes for Human Trafficking Survivors tool, which was developed by RTI International in conjunction with survivors and clinicians and case managers. Um, in programs to really identify what are the top 11 areas that trafficking survivors need support in, and then being able to measure their outcomes on all of those areas. Next slide. Okay, great. So for referrals, um, when we're contact, so I will say that TACFS does not typically work one-on-one -on -one with youth uh, in care. We are sort of operating at a more macro level than that. So we typically don't see youth in person. Um, but there, there have been times when we have been contacted by professionals about specific cases or about youth needing resources. And so our staff, you know, if we have enough information, we do engage in mandated reporting. Um, and we do that if the youth is under the age of 18 or is an adult under guardianship. We then help identify what types of resources are appropriate. Um, and then we help the referring sources determine which agencies can provide those resources, either at a county or a municipal level. Um, and then we work on making sure that those referring sources are connected to those agencies that serve the youth's community. Uh, and, you know, frankly, if there's not specific services that serve that youth's community, we will try and connect them to anyone even near the area who might be able to help or who might be able to take on some of those uh, activities that are needed in order to support that healing and recovery. Next slide. All right, so point of contact. So obviously me, I'm always willing and grateful and happy to talk to anyone about anything when it comes to human trafficking and the needs of survivors. But for training needs, technical assistance, consultation, if you have a case specific question, or maybe you are looking at it and you're going, I don't know, like I'm getting a weird vibe. I don't know if they were trafficked. I don't know what's going on. Where should I go from here? Um, or even just uh, conceptual questions around like, why, why are we saying that this type of thing is trafficking? That doesn't make sense to me. Then definitely feel free to reach out to me. My name is Sarah Hall. This is my email address. Um, I also know in the handout, my, my personal cell phone number is in there. So please reach out. Um, I'm always happy to, to take those calls. And then we also have Tiffany Greco, who is our vice president of learning. And the last thing that I'll say here is that, you know earlier I talked about how TACFS has all these different teams. Um, and I will say that every single team pr uh, provides cross support for this project. So our legislative team is uh, always on board to help really um, ensure that the needs of, of these youth are being highlighted and lifted up to the legislature. Our systems advancement team is constantly working with stakeholders uh, to, to really try and help make sure that um, that we're engaging in effective systems change, both within the courts and, uh, you know, and within the child welfare system. Uh, our communication team, you know, we put out a lot of information about human trafficking and what it is and what it looks like. Um, and our learning team, of course, uh, loves to train everyone. Um, 
So with all of that being said, I would love to pass it over to Candace Dawsman. Thanks, Sarah. Good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to be here and in this great company of all of these wonderful statewide partners. Um, I'm Candace Dossman. I'm the Collaborative Family Engagement Director with Texas CASA. And um, with me today, we have um, kind of what I'm most excited about and we'll be talking to you about today. We have Rhonda with us. Um, and Rhonda is one of our, or not one of our, she is our CASA Act consultant. And I'll have Rhonda share a little bit more about herself in just a second as well. Um, but as part of my role with Texas CASA, um, I oversee collaborative family engagement, which hopefully some of you may know about in your courts, um, or if you are parent attorneys that you've encountered, or even child attorneys. Um, so I oversee some different statewide initiatives, and this area of um, anti-child trafficking is one of our newer areas of focus for the CASA network. So that's what we're going to talk to you about um, this afternoon. And I'll have Rhonda share a little bit about herself, and then I'll share a little bit more about Texas CASA as well. Sure, Candice. Thank you. Um, I am the new anti-child trafficking consultant to Texas CASA. I actually live in Fort Bend County. I am a survivor of trafficking, and I chair the Fort Bend County District Attorney's Human Trafficking Awareness um, Committee as well. And so I'm excited to be here and share the new work that's being done at Texas CASA. Thank you. And as I said, this is relatively a new area for Texas CASA. Um, hopefully y'all know what CASA is, but CASA, um, next slide, please. Um, across the state, there are 72 local CASA programs. Um, we're serving, I think, 154 counties or so. Um, so we are in a lot of the state. Um, it might even be higher than that. Um, you can see some of our impact numbers from 2021 here. So there were almost 11,000 volunteers that served almost 30,000 children that are in foster care. So we, Texas CASA supports the local programs who again, they're all their own independent nonprofit organizations. So each CASA program operates a little bit differently. Um, and they have standards from Texas CASA that they follow. And we also have standards from national CASA um, that we all work with and follow as well. Um, yes, thank you. So CASA is court appointed special advocates. They are volunteers from the community who receive 30 hours of training and then ongoing training um, to really advocate for the best interest of children that are in foster care. So whether temporary managing conservatorship or permanent managing conservatorship, but there needs to be a suit um, filed with the parent um, for CASA to be appointed. So CASA is usually appointed as guardian ad litem. In some places, they are um, friends of the court. So it might look a little bit different in your area if you have CASAs there. So Rhonda and my role um, as Texas CASA, as Sarah said, we don't work or have contact with children that have been trafficked. We are focusing at a macro level, supporting policies and practices um, for each of the CASA programs to really figure out um, how they can best advocate for children and youth that have been trafficked or, or are at risk and how they can be involved locally. So Rhonda will share a little bit more about that with you. Next slide. So I explained I'm the ACT um, consultant to Texas CASA. So why are we saying ACTS and not CSEC or CSA? So this is an acronym that's a call to action that will be understandable by all of our volunteers. It builds off the familiar phrase of see something, say something. And so we are not only dealing with sex trafficking, but it's important for our CASA volunteers to know about and to be able to support children and youth who have experienced exploitation or trafficking in all of its forms. We also wanna make sure that we're providing a way for any program and any volunteer who has been appointed to a child who has been trafficked to know what is the best way to advocate with them. Um, their needs are very different. It must be survivor-centered and trauma-informed. And at Texas CASA, 
um, all of our Texas CASA programs or a lot of our Texas CASA programs, they've been trained in TBRI also. And we have lots of resources available to them at Texas CASA. So our CASA ACTS framework, it's gonna be two programs. One of them is going to be on how to be involved in the trafficking community, how to engage multidisciplinary teams. We wanna work on those CIT policies as well as to support volunteers and staff. The second half of that will be an, a volunteer advocacy framework. That's where we're gonna provide tips, tools, resources, guidelines on sex trafficking across the state of Texas. Dallas CASA has a wonderful model right now that, they have, that they're, they've been working on. It's the HRY program. That stands for High Risk Youth Program. So volunteers have spe specified training in human trafficking, and then only those volunteers get cases involving trafficking. We do know that not all programs across the state of Texas have the same resources. So we wanna make sure that we provide a plan of action for all programs across the state to advocate for kids, kids and youth that have been trafficked and at risk of trafficking. So that, that at risk will be the preventative um, phase. So um, next slide. So here's what we hope to do. And as we previously discussed, we are going to be building out a framework for all costs of programs to be best equipped to advocate for children and youth that are at risk of trafficking and who have been trafficked. We want to support our local programs to be able to join their MDTs um, through a, a sharing a list of MBT, MDTs in their area and also templates of protocols. We want to support programs also to use the SEAT tool responsibly and in the best interest of the child. While working with CPS, we want to be mindful of the information, how to do the tool, and also what to do with this information once we receive it. We want to pr provide trainings, trainings with Dallas CASA and also trainings across the state that have been vetted both online and in person. So what we do know, we know that there are a lot of people and stakeholders that are involved, and we want to make sure that we support them, we fill in any gaps, but we do not duplicate services or get in the way. Next slide. Perfect, thank you. And I'll just add to Rhonda's point about the See It tool, um, that Texas CASA is trained to train this um, tool to our local CASA programs. Um, so we have someone on staff that does do that training specifically for staff at CASA programs. Um, so if you encounter a volunteer that says they would like to do the see it, um, we are not training volunteers to do that tool. We are training staff. Um, and then we are also working with DFPS trafficking team um, to develop an MOU and an agreement of understanding of how DFPS and CASA programs locally um, can work together to complete the CIETs, to refer to care coordination, and really all of those local interactions that will occur between CASA and CPS. So that's something else that we're actively working on right now, and hopefully we'll be able to release that MOU um, in the next month or two. And then in terms of our points of contact or your points of contact, if you have you know, case-specific child or family-specific questions or concerns, those would go to your local CASA program. Um, and if you need you know, that contact information, you absolutely can reach out to myself or Rhonda. Um, but then in terms of CASA acts that Rhonda has shared with you about, she would be her the contact for that. And her email is there, as is mine. If you have any other questions or ideas um, or other areas you'd really love to see Texas CASA focus on in this area, we would love to hear from you about that. All right, that's what we have. So I'm gonna pass it over to Ryan. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Amy, I'm actually gonna do a little bit of an audible. I'm gonna take uh, the second slide first and then come back to the map. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, my name is Ryan Bristow. I am the Regional County Program Administrator for North and Northeast Texas. Um, my role is, uh, I work with a team of five that serve the seven regions of state of Texas juvenile probation departments. There's uh, 156 departments with serving on 256 counties. And we roll out and are um, experts in our regions regarding needs and lack of resources and things like that. And we also do our special projects like this one. Um, so with regard to our work, 
pursuant to Senate Bill 1356 in the 83rd legislative session, we were instructed to develop a training related to uh, human trafficking. And what we did was receive a grant from the Office of the Governor to implement the CIT at the county level and at the juvenile probation department level. And so there's, a, like I said, 165 individual departments. And as of the end of 2021, we have 153 of those departments that have been trained and activated the tool. And they had a really good involvement here with completing 50,990 screenings. And that's without having a, a standard or universal screening requirement. So the field really rallied to this tool and this population to try to, to try to identify and get these people resources. And so then you see TJ's mission, um, you know, really transforming young lives and creating safer communities. Amy, last slide, please. Thank you. And so as I mentioned the regions, as we started our work about, you know, in 2018, we rolled out the tool. Um, and then in 2020, right before the pandemic started, we started collaborating with the Office of the Governor and, and DFPS regarding best practices and what's, what are our next steps now that we have this tool. And so what you see here is a map of, uh, of the state of Texas divided into, by color, the probation regions. But then by the numbers is our collaboration with the Office of the Governor child sex trafficking team. And that was so that our field would know who are the subject matter experts in these regions with possible resources or to help collaborate with to deliver good outcomes for these identified youth. Next slide, please. And so what we did was is we started by rolling out the tool. And as you saw, we've completed nearly 51,000 uh, uh, CIA assessments. And then we decided what the next steps are is that we need a two pillar approach. If I have a child that is a clear concern and I need to get that child resources, we need to have um, a approach that shows them where these resources are. And as has been mentioned by many of these presenters is some areas are more rich in resources than others. And so we developed a handbook here that's a free field resource guide that really kind of outlines where these resources are and what, what kind of services they can be expected and then how, who are the gatekeepers. And so this has been provided to every juvenile probation department in the state of Texas. And we'll be currently actively updating it with the Office of the Governor as we just uh, went through a new grant period. And so we'll be updating those that are no longer receiving an Office of the Governor grant and those that have come back on as new resources. Next slide, please. We also receive all of the CIT information directly to us from the county probation departments. And so we are a resource to those county probation departments to help really analyze their data and break it down as not everyone has, you know, the time or, or you know, that they just don't know which question to ask or how do, I, how do I even approach this? And so we really take it and we created some dashboards that kind of help you to visualize where these uh, hotspots are or maybe an age bracket or if you're trying to maybe do a targeted grant, we want to really be a resource so that we can uh, have a real educated discussion. So we provide these um, to our regional or to our, our probation departments about once a month with a, a monthly breakdown. Then we have about seven pages where it's broken down by region, but we do also have the availability to break it down by individual department and a, a number of other ways. Next slide, please. And as I said, the, the regionalization team is uh, Ashley Kinzer is our manager, and then there's the, the five of us. We all live within our regions. Uh, Dr. Poplacios is community mental health program administrator for the entire state of Texas and a fantastic resource for us. Helps coordinate services with the, uh, many of our state partners. Um, and so we're really the, if you need anything in, in the region that you're assigned to, we're, we're at your resource. And um, I'll pass it over to Judge Larson today. Okay, thank you. I. I hope everybody learned as much as I did because I'm just sitting here taking frantic notes and uh, getting tons of good information. So I really appreciate all the effort that our presenters have put into compiling this information for us. And uh, everybody spoke quickly. So we actually have a, even a little bit of extra time for a panel discussion. So we can talk a little bit more about kind of how your agencies intersect with each other and other service providers, and then hopefully be able to have you guys answer some audience questions. Um, if you guys uh, have any questions that you'd like to have our panelists answer, please feel free, don't be shy, put them in the Q&A and we will try to get to them. 
Um, we do have some questions that I wanted to start with. Um, one concerns the see it tool. And so many of you referred to the, the uh, see it tool that's the West Coast Clinics um, screening tool that identifies the level of risk of children for being trafficked. So it isn't um, an assessment per se, but it really identifies just the level of risk. And so it sounds like um, many of you are already using it or trying to uh, onboard it. And so how many of you guys are already using it in this group? Okay. And so DFPS, it sounds like, are you, where are you guys in the process of um, moving over to use the see it? Because it sounds like in, in uh, Alan's data, there's, there was a previous tool being used. Can you let us know kind of what DFPS has on the horizon for screening? Yeah, so we've, we've been using the see it tool for a couple of years now in the five largest counties in Texas. So uh, Dallas County, Tarrant County, Harris, Bear, and Travis. Um, and so the, that is where about 50% of kids that are in conservatorship reside. So, yeah, so there is a, a, a pilot that we're looking at um, working in Webb County. I don't know a whole lot about that. I haven't been on those meetings, but it's coming um, and to look at something different. And it truly is just a, a looking at how all of this works with everybody else that's doing the SEA tool. So, yeah, we have been using it for several years. Okay, great. And, and so... It look. It sounds like there may be efforts to expand the use of the see it tool to smaller counties as well. I think that that's what the pilot is going to help us identify is what that could potentially look like, and what resources, additional resources, may be needed for DFPS to make that happen. Great, great. And then of uh, of the the rest of the agency, you guys are all using the see it in some form. Who does the screening? I think for CASA, you mentioned that it's not being done by volunteers, but you have employees who are trained to do it. Um, in terms of the other agencies that are using it, the probation departments, um, Mr. Bristow, do you have a sense? Is, is, there, is there sort of a uniform approach to administering it or does that vary from department to department? Yes, we, we um, collected some policy and procedure over the last couple of months. Uh, and, and what we did was last month or last week, we actually had a training with the field to let them know what best practice was. But at this time, it is somewhat patchworked. And like I said, we don't have a standard currently. We, we really wanted to roll this out thoughtfully. We wanted it, the field to get their hands on it. We wanted them to just kind of see what does that look like from an economies of scale and resources, and then kind of help inform this um, have a better informed discussion. So currently it is more patchwork. We have some counties that do universal screenings, rescreen every 90 days. Some have developed their own red flags uh, and when they'll do it from a probation officer standpoint. Um, some will do it at intake, at a detention intake and they'll train those officers. Um, at TJJD, we do complete it on any kid that committed to us at intake. Okay. And I know that um, in Travis County where I am, the probation department uh, administers that screening tool for every single kid who gets referred for in any context, in any way. And then when new information comes along, they continue to reassess to make sure that the screening tool is accurate because there may be just a gap in information um, that indicates a no concern. And as they move through the system, and I'm sure this is true through all the systems, then more information comes to light that changes that score. So we need to be responding appropriately. So that's um, good that everyone's using that tool. I see, okay, Sarah answered that question. So somebody asked what the lowest age is for uh, validity of the see it tool. And I'm seeing the answer is 10 years old, but in some cases it can be used with youth as young as eight. Um, And I'm looking at questions. So along with the see it tool, are there any other 
things that you guys either use yourselves in your agencies or recommend that other service providers use to assess risk and kind of stage in the process um, of kids who are either at really high risk or actively being trafficked? Yes. Judge Larson, I was just, I was just gonna add with the see it before moving on to the other tools. I think it's important to note that it's not a tool that is done with the young person. Um, and so that age discrepancy, I think there could be a little bit of room there, as Sarah said, it could be done for an eight-year-old versus with. I don't want someone to think they sit with the young person and do that tool with them. Yes, and I appreciate your bringing that up. It's a really good point and super important to note that the see it information is designed to be collected from collateral information about the child. So if you actually look at the, the list, it's a list of kind of indicators, but those aren't indicators that are designed to sit down with the child and say, have you ever been uh, in a situation where you've had to exchange, you know, sex for something of value. It's not, it's not conducted like that. And the West Coast Clinic that sponsors the tool require, they'll, they'll offer it for free, I believe, but they require training, which is a good thing for people who are interested in administering that. And I know the governor's office has been working to try to get that to be kind of the uniform screening tool that we use in Texas across the board so that everyone's speaking the same language since there is so much interconnection. Um, and, and Mr. Schomburg, I don't know if you wanna to speak to that for another minute. And then Mr. Bristow, I saw you had, had a hand up, so I'll come back to you. Sure, the, the use of the tool, it's on a public domain from West Coast. So as you said, Judge Larson, it's available for anybody to take a look at and actually to uh, employ. We are training, all of our regional administrators are uh, certified trainers in the tool, as are others around the state. We have folks uh, both with JJD as well as at the Alliance, as Sarah noted. Uh, we've got some trainers in DFPS, CASA has trainers, uh, CACs of Texas uh, does not currently, but individual or local CACs do. So it is not hard to find somebody who is providing training to get into a course. Uh, what I would recommend is that for the most part, uh, while it, we have a number of um, courtrooms that have decided to have a clerk or somebody in there uh, become a user of the tool because they can then interpret information that might be coming from, as you mentioned, collateral sources. The uh, greatest, uh, use of the tool is from folks who are in regular and ongoing contact with that child where subsequent disclosures can take place. So uh, episodic or occasional contact with a child is going to provide much less information that can be placed into the screening process than a CASA, for example, who can have a regular relationship, a CSA advocate, uh, somebody, a probation officer, uh, DFES caseworker, any number of folks who are going to have regular and ongoing uh, contact and who are in the kind of relationship with the child is likely to disclose tidbits. Rarely do they disclose, I have been trafficked because they don't recognize or identify with that, but they'll uh, provide tidbits that can uh, be aggregated into that tool. Thank you. And Mr. Bristow, did you have something you wanted to add? Yes, I just wanted to add, like, as, as what everyone said, as far as having that real relationship with the kid to have the best information possible, it's, it's not a dynamic tool, it's a moment in time. So from Monday to Tuesday, the, the score could change. And so the, the probation departments also do utilize a validated risk and needs assessment, which is the positive achievement change tool. And that does allow us to have some additional dynamic information within the, uh, uh, the excuse me, the trauma scores as well as you know, high risk mental health and things like that, that they're provided at that local level and required to complete. And so it's an additional tool that is dynamic and building upon, especially when there's a relationship or even a, an initial contact. And so it does help out there. And that's helpful to, to add that information. The more information we can get to kind of plug into the big picture, the better. So that's, that's really useful. Um, so when we do end up seeing kids and we saw some data on, there's a substantial number of clear concern kids that we 
have discovered through the use of the See It tool. Um, once we do identify a child through that tool as a clear concern, um, what, what's the best way for whoever gets that score? What should they be doing? Like, what would you, if somebody calls you at your agency and says, you know, hey, because we have hospitals that are using screening tools now and schools are doing it, there's a, it's, it's, it's becoming more and more widespread. So somebody who finds a child and says, I got this clear concern score, what, what should I do? What would you guys tell them? All right, uh, Ms. McLeod. Well, at first, I mean, I think that in Texas, you know, everybody's a mandated reporter. And if this child, if an individual has been screened as under 18, then you need to call statewide intake and have that report made to the child abuse and neglect hotline. It's really important. I'm so glad that you brought this up, not just to call and tell our statewide people, hey, I got a clear concern, because they may not understand exactly what you mean. You need to tell them all the things that got you to that clear concern. Right. What are all the concerns that you have? What's specifically going on with this particular child? Because they have to figure out, does it fall within our jurisdiction that we talked about earlier, which is a traditional caregiver, or does this need to be referred to law enforcement? And we need to give, if it's leaving us and going to law enforcement, as much information as we can possibly give them to be able to uh, take action on what, what's been given to them. That's super helpful. Thank you for, for You're welcome. pointing that out. What about the other agencies? You get a call, somebody has a clear concern kiddo, what, what points would you uh, refer them out to or recommend that they do? Yes, Ms. Hall. Uh, thank you, Judge Larson. Um, so a couple of things, one, yes, always mandated reporting, um, but then beyond that, we would look at, okay, like where is this kid located? Where's their residence, right? Um, in order to determine, is there a CSA advocacy agency near them? If so, we would try and get them connected to the closest CSA advocacy agency. Um, if there isn't one that's within their jurisdiction, then we would move on to communicating with the local like child advocacy center. Um, because even if they don't have a care coordination team, they may have uh, available resources such as therapists and so on um, that, that could be working with this child. Um, we would also be looking at, right, like what are the kids' needs in the moment? Do they need housing? In which case we would try to find a, like a, a program or, 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 or a safe housing situation for them, whether that's a drop-in center near them, whether that's, um, whether that's reaching out to programs that may also take community kids if these kids aren't already in the care of DFPS. Uh, so we would be trying to connect them um, basically to whoever in the state that is closest to them geographically um, and that is able to provide the services that the child specifically needs. Excellent, thank you. Anybody else have anything that you would direct somebody who comes across a, a child who's clear concern to do off the bat. Okay. And so um, we have a, a question from the audience asking, do you have some suggestions for how to respond in a trauma-informed manner when a child makes an outcry to their attorney or caseworker? And that kind of ties in with sort of uh, another question that I'll get to, um, and, and that is what's the appropriate way to talk to a child who's being trafficked or is clear concern, but is not in a place where they are willing to make an outcry. Um, so let's start with that first question. You get an outcry, an attorney or caseworker, what's the best thing to do at that point? Mr. Sean Bourne. Well, they, Ada said exactly what I think all of us on this panel would have said. The first time you get any indication that a child's been victimized, make a mandatory report. Uh, it's important to know that even if the DFPS has initiated previously an investigation, information shared with you may be new and or not known to the uh, DFPS folks who are investigating. And so that information needs to be connected to ongoing or initiate a new uh, investigation. 
I think what, what Sarah said earlier is very important as well. And that's at the same time, their service needs. So based on what's going on with the child, if in today's weather, if they happen to be out on the street and uh, they make a, a disclosure uh, when they're not safe, then that's a separate issue again, because as Ada said, it may or may not fall within jurisdiction. The other call to make, the other notification right away can be to law enforcement because law enforcement, again, doesn't have that jurisdictional boundary that Ada referenced, uh, and they're going to respond in order to uh, find out, again, uh, whether a crime has been committed. The other important piece is that through the information shared today and the handouts that have been delivered, it's important to begin to attend to where resources are, have been stood up in communities, where capacity has been built to be responsive. So one of the greatest takeaways from this will be uh, recognizing that there are resources that didn't exist 10 years ago or five years ago that are now available in communities. And it's important to begin to, to get to, to begin to familiarize uh, yourself with those resources in order to, to feel confident about passing along a child in need to one of those resources. Thank you. I, I feel like one of the components of that question, though, also aside from kind of the steps that you should take as an attorney is how how do you respond? So you have a client, you're talking to them and they say this happened and you don't want to just say, OK, I'm going to I'm a mandatory reporter. I'm going to call CPS. <laughs> what do you what, what can you how, what kind of conversation should you have? And I see Ms. Hall um, with a with a, I know what is going to be a good answer. Well, so partially with my background in counseling, but then also, you know, knowing my own experiences and when I went through this myself, um, when that disclosure is made, it's really important first off that you stay calm, right? Like this can be, a, this can be a really challenging topic. I know that all of you are professionals, um, but it is really important to stay calm. It's important to make sure that you understand what the, what the youth is saying to you. If they're having strong emotions about it as they're talking, right? Like if they're really sad or really angry, you can say like, look, I understand. Like, I understand that this is really upsetting for you. I know that it's gotta be so hard for you to share this with me. And I wanna thank you for being brave enough to, to share this with me right now. I think it shows that you trust me and I appreciate that trust. Now, you know, moving forward, now that you have shared this with me, you know, there are some people that I'm going to have to call in order to try and help keep you safe. And honestly, one of the things that I would suggest, if at all possible, is um, asking the child if they want to make that phone call to CPS with you, right? Like you help give them agency in that moment over how their story is being shared. They're part of it. You're not like just kind of pushing them away and going, oh God, hang on, let me leave you alone in a room, right? You want to make sure that that they're being that they're with someone through this process. Even even if you do, even if they don't want to make that call with you and you need to step out and go make that call, right? Like making sure that there's somebody in the room that they feel safe with. Um, and uh, somebody who's willing to just talk to them. This is not. We don't respond to this in an investigative way, at least not during a first disclosure. We leave that to, to law enforcement or CPS. Um, so it's not going to be suddenly asking a million questions about it, but it's going to be, you know, just, just verbalizing that you appreciate that they trusted you enough to tell you and that because they have told you this, you want to take those steps to help keep them safe because they are important and they are, they are valuable people, right? So you're going to communicate that emotionally. You're going to you're going to attend to the child's emotions in that moment, um, and then you're going to see if you can give them some agency and some empowerment uh, by offering that that they can be the ones who are with you on the call. They can provide more detail to CPS, right? Um, so it's it's giving them choices and ownership in that moment. It's not just. I said this thing and bam, all the adults got freaked out and now they're running around and having a lot of conversations about me behind my back, right? It's um, it's that kind of personal framing. And I think that's wonderful. And um, 
And Ms. Kirkendall, looks like you wanted to add. Yes, ma'am. What I would also add is that attorneys can seek out um, TBR training. Um, TCU has several options for TBR training, and it even there's even certain trainings that are related um, specifically to working with trafficking survivors. And so within that training, it'll teach about, I know one of the other questions is about red flags. So you get a more comprehensive education as to what goes on with survivors, and you know how to deal with them at all of the stages of change that they go through. It's very common for for them not to understand what sex trafficking even is. They've never heard that terminology. They hold all the guilt themselves. And so for attorneys to seek out and get training on their own, and this training is, it's a, probably, I remember it being um, eight to 10 hour training. So it's a, it's a pretty good amount of education in one chunk of time. And that's, that's a really good suggestion as well. Um, the TBRI training in terms of how to understand the best trauma-informed lens through which you can see other people who have been through this trauma and engage with the world through that lens is kind of how I see it. And it's so helpful. So the, the last thing we wanna do is re-traumatize these kiddos who are brave enough to, to tell us what's going on. And so those are really, really helpful suggestions. And I think just kind of adding to that, um, which you, uh, implied is, you know, no judgment. So just making it really clear, like Ms. Hall said, you know, that this is really brave of you to tell me this, because I'm sure that it, it, it must be really, really difficult for those kiddos to, to get to that point. And then that kind of goes back to a question that somebody else asked, which is, what if you have kiddos who have all the the makings of being trafficked that you can see from your perspective, but they are not in a place where they feel like um, they're being trafficked or, or for various reasons. Partly, I think kiddos can be ashamed to acknowledge it. A lot of times, I think they just genuinely don't believe that's what's happening. Somebody loves them, they're taking good care of them. This is my boyfriend. Um, there can be a lot of threats and coercion that prevent them from feeling safe to disclose. So there's a whole lot of reasons why kids who are being trafficked won't say anything. And so if you're working with a kiddo like that and you see the red flags, but they're not in the ready to, to talk about it or even able to talk about it, what's the best way to approach those kiddos? Any thoughts? Ms. Hall? Okay, sorry, I was giving the other people chances to raise their hands because I don't wanna just, you know, monopolize this. Um, so, you know, I um, we actually, TACFS, we do have uh, stages of change training that we've developed um, spe specifically for commercially sexually exploited youth. And in that, um, you'll see that it's not even until they hit like the third or fourth stage that they're really able to even typically verbalize their victimization or understand that what happened to them was wrong. Um, and that does feed into a lot of why this is a population that doesn't frequently make outcries and why they may not be responsive to that language when it's first being used around them. And so, you know, once again, I, I would suggest approaching that with gentleness, right? Like, you know, yes, sure. They're not going to believe that they've been trafficked at first for the most part. Um, and also the language that we use with them, you know, as much as possible, you know, mirror some of the language that they're using about, right? Like if they're saying, oh, well, no, that's just my job, right? Then like you would refer to it as their job, but with the understanding internally that they're discussing being exploited, or if they're referring to their boyfriend, right? Like we might not want to, we might not want to like reinforce like, oh yeah, he's your boyfriend. But we might say, okay, yes. So this older man or this older person um, is asking you to do X, Y, Z, right? Like, how does that make you feel? Like, do you feel safe in that? Like, is this, right? There are there are a lot of different strategies that you can take in, in so far as communicating to them. I think the way that you communicate about them to other people and the way you communicate with them are two different things because you may have that high level understanding amongst you and your colleagues, right? Like 
this kid has been trafficked and also they're currently at a stage where they don't believe that about themselves. And if we say it, they're just going to get mad. So it's, it's kind of, it can sometimes be kind of a slow process where you're like, okay, yeah. And have you ever considered, right? Like if you think that this is, that, that what's going on is fine, like maybe what does that look like? Like, is this a life that you'd want for your best friend? Okay, no, right? So you can talk about it in more general terms around like, it sounds like he really hurt you, or it sounds like there are some things that are going on that you don't really like, or that maybe don't feel good. Um, so you, you know, you can have those two different modes of operating, one where you're speaking to the client gently and understanding that that's a sensitive, that that's sensitive language to try and say, oh, you're a trafficking victim. Um, but then, you know, sort of at a high level with other people and other agencies around you going, okay, yeah, they, they've hit these red flags for trafficking. We're very concerned. This is what we're noticing. Here's what their score was on the see it, right? Um, does that make, am I explaining that well? Okay. I think so. So it sounds like you're saying to interact with the child in a way that meets them where they are. So you're not mm -hmm. trying to push them in any way to make an outcry. You're just kind of helping them explore what's going on and how they feel about it and taking their answers at face value, but trying to connect them with appropriate resources and advocates who may be able to help them where they are and, and Ideally, they would get to a place where they're willing or able to, to move further and disclose. Yes, it's not so much a case of leading the witness here. We, we pull in other experts to try and, and do that in a more gentle way. So, right, right. Yeah. Mr. Bristow, did you have something you wanted to add on, on that? Yeah, just with respect to, uh, you know, the judges and, and the attorneys, you know, probation officers are, we have made available motivational interviewing training, which is huge. Um, we've actually been working on the idea of TBRI, but not TBRI probation, like not, it doesn't just apply to a residential facility. It's how you approach holistically your probation department. And so if you're, you're, you're a judge in your area and you're curious, like what resources we have or how that's looking as far as like with your area, we're a, we're a, a resource to you all. We have trainers, we have funded, uh, the one out of TCU is fantastic. You know, we've, we've got a lot of approach that way. And the Texas model, if you're interested in that is another thing we try to push through to try to be more, um, you know, really sensitive to this population, asking open-ended questions. I know when I served as a probation officer, there was a lot of noticing things. You have many cell phones. This is not normal. It's, it's really having that awareness of what a normal childhood looks like versus what doesn't look like. And then those at-risk behaviors. And so uh, red flags lists, we've collected red flags lists all the way from England just to get an idea of what that looks like. Um, and it's almost all the same. And so, um, you know, we're happy to share that with you or if your department needs any help, we're happy to help out as well. Thank you, that is excellent. Um, one thing that comes up that that is difficult as well is recruiting. So we see kiddos who are in placement or on probation who we're trying to work with, um, but there are concerns about recruiting and sometimes they're forced to or pressured to recruit. And so any thoughts about how to, how to handle that aspect? Ms. Kirkendall? I know that here in Fort Bend County, our girls court, they have level one and level two. Um, and so those two girls, they don't combine or mix together. And so that deters some of the recruiting that can go on. I mean, and I, we always have to remember that even if a survivor is recruiting, she's still a victim. And so that's, and that happens very, very frequently. And that, and that's, that's good to remember. Um, I do have a couple questions that people have asked about who is, it, who is most at risk for being trafficked and what are the red flags that we should be looking for? And those are such fundamental good questions that everybody, no matter whether you work with kids or not, like you can be at a gas station pumping gas and see a situation that once you get trained and know what to look for, you will see you will know if you're seeing something that looks fishy and, and needs to be reported and, and investigated. And so I don't know that we can go through all that today with this group. We're kind of trying to give resources, but I 
encourage every single person on this call to look at the resource list in the PowerPoint and contact these agencies and get a training that helps you understand what those red flags are. One thing I can say, and you guys can expand on that is every kiddo who's in the system, either juvenile justice or uh, CPS is at exceptionally high risk for being trafficked. And they're not only those kids, but especially those kids. Um, and so does anyone have anything you wanna add to that kind of that we have time to, to just a, a bullet point that we, we need to get out, Ms. Hall? Sure, so I went ahead and dropped um, our uh, Human Trafficking Awareness Month fact sheet into the chat and that does have a list of like common signs of exploitation or uh, common risk factors and then you know potential red flags. Um, it's not a comprehensive list, but it is a good place to start. Um, and then I think, you know, really just the biggest risk factors, you know, we, we talk about how um, being in foster care or being in, involved in the juvenile justice system are risk factors, but really what that is, is that the same things that make kids vulnerable to going into foster care or, or going into juvenile justice, right, that lack of social supports, the abuse and trauma and neglect early in their life, um, it's not necessarily that foster care and juvenile justice are like the gateways to human trafficking. It's that the same things that make kids vulnerable for being involved in these systems are those same vulnerabilities that exploiters are looking for is that lack of social support. Exactly. And frankly, every teenager who feels like no, nobody understands them and wants to be loved and wants to fit in it's so easy for somebody to come in, particularly with social media and say, figure out exactly where their weaknesses are. What's bothering them? They got in a fight with their mom. They're really upset. They want to leave home. Nobody cares about them. So there's all, every kid is vulnerable. Every single kid. Think about how you felt when you were a teenager um, and what it would feel like to, if you believe that there was somebody out there who really wanted to take care of you and loved you and understood you. And so I know the um, Attorney General's office has a video called Be the One. There are so many good trainings and all these guys are critical primary um, Texas advocates and players in this field who can and have provided resources and will provide training. So please, please get that training. Um, Alan. Just two quick thoughts. Uh, we we're about out of time. One is there's, you'll see billboards around the state coming up with uh, Be Real, which is a new campaign that we are partnering with the McCain Institute out of Arizona to and the uh, outdoor advertising of Texas folks uh, that if you look for those and we can drop that link or send it to you actually it's on my handouts come to think of it so you can both access that to find good information for yourself and please provide it to kids with whom you work because th thank you very much Candace or, or Rhonda whoever put that in it's really valuable for kids to go there and recognize that what they're experiencing is not what, as uh, I think Sarah said earlier, it's not what they would want for their friend. They don't see it as a problem for themselves because I, I overlook the, all the red flags. They see that they wouldn't want that coming from a friend or to be experienced by a friend. The other thing, just real quickly, is I, most of the folks on this call are not surprised. I have the statewide data from the screening up on my computer because it's always up on my computer. And I, I want to just globally point out a couple things in addition to the two systems as the highest indicators, child welfare system, juvenile justice system. The other top three are runaway, problems with school, and lastly, self-destructive. Uh, so if you see those three things occurring and the biggest issue with uh, school attendance and with runaway is exactly as you said earlier, Judge Larson, they're detaching themselves from more mainstream, normalized or healthy systems. So if they stop going to school, they're not gonna be on other kids who are not involved, who might point things out to them. And that's one of the, the lures of the traffickers to start disconnecting them from family, from friends and others who might notice what's going on in yeah. their life. 
And Polaris Project, if you Google that, has a lot of great, great resources and information on the red flags and the dynamics. The National Council for Juvenile and Family Court Judges has a whole new toolbox and all kinds of resources on their website and trainings as well. And so unfortunately, we're out of time. There was a good question about attorneys and how they can best interact with uh, advocates. Um, and so we can try to kind of get to, to answer that after the, after the seminar ends by email, if you guys have ideas. But I just wanna say thank you so, so much to all of our presenters and to the Children's Commission and my co-chair, Judge Morellis, for uh, hosting this webinar. And thank you all for attending because every little bit that we learn, and I learned a lot today, is, is gonna make a difference. And we all are gonna be able to do better in helping to, to support these, these kiddos. So thank you. We wanna go